Well, good morning. Once again, if this is your first time with us, I would just like to say um, <clears throat> welcome. And if you could do me a huge favor, either send us a message either on uh, Facebook uh, or if you don't mind, you can drop your email in the comment section. And also, I have a, a huge favor to ask if you would also, um, and I saw it was funny, I, while they're leading worship, I kind of clicked on the live stream and my favorite, Sean, was like, uh, bro, he was high fives and bro hugs uh, to everyone. And so uh, it's awesome watching you guys all give each other shout outs. But hey, we are so uh, glad that you're with us. And I pray that you would uh, all uh, interact. I know this is different for all of us, but to make this as personal as we can. But today is a special day in the life of our church. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know this or not. But today, we celebrate that we are one years old. And so a, a year ago this week, we launched our church service for the first time as officially as a church. Uh, and it was an incredible day. But it has been an incredible year. It's been an incredible last year and a half. But the last year, what we've seen God do is nothing short of miraculous. Uh, as we've watched God supernaturally do what only he could take credit for. And what's been so exciting is we've seen so far 66 people step from death to life. But what's more incredible than that, um, and, and then follow the Lord in baptism, is that we've had 15 different people baptizing those 66 people. That means that we've seen dads baptizing their children. We've seen neighbors baptizing neighbors. We've seen bosses baptizing their employees. We've seen coworkers baptizing coworkers. We've seen college friends baptize their college friend. We've seen friends baptize people from the gym or, or wherever. And we've even seen a husband get to baptize his wife. It has been absolutely incredible. Just so much so that as I've thought about it, I thought about all the times I've literally been brought to tears this year by the goodness of our God. And so, uh, and literally, because we've seen in the last year, we've seen our vision statement come to life. If you're new, our vision statement is simply this. Our, we have a vision here at Epic Life to see Christ followers transforming their everyday places into sacred spaces where people can connect to Christ. We believe that the church is not a building, it's a people. I've had to tell myself that over and over in the last week and a half as we now face new and difficult challenges. But I also want to remind us as we meet throughout in each other's homes that the church of Jesus Christ is not missing a beat. That though it might be different from us than what we're, what we're used to, God is still on his throne. He's very much at work. In fact, this last Sunday, Facebook became very aware of how much the church was alive and that the church actually crashed it for a while. In fact, uh, also, we, we think from the best estimates that we can say on a low end, we had 314 people that were worshiping and all the way up to on a high estimate, 471 people, which is way above what would normally be here on a Sunday morning. Live church reported this past Sunday uh, of churches using their online platform, church, uh, the church online broadcast platform, they saw 28,000 people last weekend make a decision to follow Christ. So what I would say is that we should be encouraged by what the Lord is doing in our country in the midst of a difficult time. And last week, as we kind of entered this new season, we kicked off a brand new series we call An Unshakable Hope. Why? Because Jesus is our unshakable hope. And if there's ever been a time in our country that I can ever think of where our country and the people need to be reminded, or maybe you need to be reminded, or I need to sometimes be reminded, that Jesus is our unshakable hope. I don't think there's anyone that's watching this live stream that has not been negatively impacted in some way, shape, or form by all that's going on. Some of you have been impacted more, already losing jobs, but nonetheless, all of us have been impacted. And because your life has been disrupted by the reality of what's going on, there's quite possibly this reality that could be playing out in your life, that you're experiencing some form of worry, fear, or anxiety. And if that's the case, because I know it is. 
I just want to remind you that it's natural in life to experience anxiousness. In fact, it's unavoidable. The presence of anxiety is something that we cannot avoid. But I want to remind you what we said throughout last week and what we said throughout the whole Anxious for Nothing series, that the presence of anxiety is unavoidable, but the prison of anxiety is absolutely something we can avoid. It's optional. You see, being anxious is not a sin, or having an anxious feeling is not a sin. It's unavoidable. But what you choose to do with that anxious feeling absolutely matters. So much that I would say, how you choose to deal with your anxious thoughts and feelings will determine whether you are held captive by them. I've been reminded of that all week. What I do with, when I feel myself getting anxious, what I do with those feelings will determine whether I become a slave to anxiety and fear or become a conqueror and, and someone who perseveres in the midst of trying times. That's why it's so critical for you, if you're watching online today, for you to understand that you need to be very selective in who you allow to speak into your lives. That's why all week long I've been hosting Zoom calls so that we could do the E3 reading plan. I'm going to continue to do that every night, Monday through Thursday at 7 p.m., you can hop on and get on a Zoom call with me, and we just will walk through the Bible. And it's been incredible. I've gotten to meet so many different people that I didn't really know from our church. In fact, I told Abby, it matters so much of who we allow to speak into us. I told Abby and I told our staff this week that I'm going to be very selective of who I allow in my life moving forward. This past week and the last couple of weeks, I've been in Zoom calls with church planners, pastors, and leaders from all over the country. And, and what I can tell you is, in some of those meetings, man, there's just been a spirit of power and love and, 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 a, and a sound mind. And then there's been some meetings where it just seems like there's a lot of panic and a lot of fear. And I've just determined in my heart that I can't be a part of and subject myself to meetings where it's always ramped up to number 10 all the time. Because here's what I know about myself, that when I do that, I'm miserable to be around uh, after that, and I like literally, it takes me, I had to go mow grass after one of my calls this week for an hour just so I could like blow off steam. It's like, this is like crazy, like people are freaking out. But what I also can say is I was on a call this week and a call the week before, and they were led by leaders that are incredible. People that have shown themselves to be time and time again, men and women who are controlled by the Spirit of God that have display a spirit of power, of love, and one of sound mind. And I can tell you this, those are the meetings, those are the people that I want to surround myself with in this time of uncertainty. And as I thought about what does it look like to be a leader who is self-controlled, someone who's not giving in to a spirit of fear, someone who's not always uh, acting reactive, but rather as being proactive. I thought there's no greater example throughout the New Testament outside of Jesus than Paul. Paul continually showed that he was a man that had a spirit of power, one of love and of sound mind. I mean, if there was anyone who understood uncertainty, it was Paul. If there was anyone who understood trials, it was Paul. If there was anyone who understood suffering, it was Paul. And if there was anyone that felt like their life had been put on hold and was in a holding pattern for years, sometimes being in prison, it was Paul. But when you read his letters, you never ever will pick up or get a sense that he was in panic mode or that he was freaked out or he was worried that his God was not going to come through. No, Paul always was confident. He was just the opposite of that. He absolutely displayed a spirit of power, of love, and a mind that was self-controlled. And that spirit 
that same spirit lives in you. And if you will let Jesus work in your life like Paul did, it will allow your life to declare boldly like what Paul's did, and that Jesus is our unshakable hope and ever-present in times of trouble and in need. Now, having said this, I recognize this. I recognize that there are a lot of you watching, possibly, maybe not a lot, but there's, there's plenty of you that are watching online right now. And you would say something to me like this, Brent, I know that God's promised me. I know God's promised me to have a spirit that's not a fear, that's of power, that's of love, that's of self-control. But if I'm honest right now, Brent, that's not what I'm feeling. This week when I got sent home from work, or this week when I lost a loved one, or this week when you, Nate, you fill in the blank, when life went south, Brent, any, I felt anything but peace. And if that's the case, I would say, well, you're probably right. You probably did feel those things. And there's nothing wrong with feeling those things. But what I want you to recognize is in the midst of those feelings, God is present. In the midst of you being angry or you being scared, God is present. And he's working. He is working all things together. So when you hear me talking about having the the ability to boldly proclaim that Jesus is our unshakable hope during times of great uncertainty and unbelievable hurt and pain, I recognize your first thought probably is, how? How? And what I would hope is this morning we could all lean in to the words written by Paul. as as he lays out a blueprint for us and answers the question, how? You see, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 12, Paul says this. He goes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So what is Paul telling us? He is telling us, he's telling you, he's telling me, that if we are in Christ, then we are jars of clay. And that because we're jars of clay, we are salt with the sole purpose of doing one thing. And that is carrying around a treasure. And what is that treasure? That treasure is the all-surpassing power of the Spirit of God. It's a power that's from God. It's not from us. And that is why Paul clearly was not afraid of trials and suffering because he knew he was just a vessel. He was just a carrier, and he was not a carrier of fear. He was not a carrier of anything other than the hope and all-surpassing power of God Almighty. And Paul also believed that God was willing to guard the vessel, that being himself, as long as he was willing to guard the treasure that being the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul knew that until Jesus was through with him, that no weapon could could come against him. That's why he wrote this in verse 8. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul was absolutely certain that no weapon formed against him could destroy him or take him down. And what Paul wants you and me to understand is this, that when you feel hard-pressed 
on every side by this world that you will not be crushed. That when you're perplexed by your circumstances in life, that you do not have to live in despair. And that even if you are struck down, resulting in death, that even death doesn't get the final say. That if we are in Christ, we will spend eternity with our Heavenly Father. I've had to remind myself that over and over and over again these last four weeks. Especially this week as a former student, now someone I would call a dear friend, lost her dad this week to the coronavirus. I know for my family and for people that I'm friends with, we have just been heartbroken and sad all week long. I've known Brenda since she was a freshman, and I've known her husband Connor since he was in the seventh grade. I've known their family for almost 13 years now. And I can speak for anyone that knows and loves them. We've all felt completely helpless this week to do anything to comfort them because of all the social distancing. But the hardest thing even for me to think is knowing these boys, Brenda, their mom, TJ's parents, had to say goodbye to their dad through FaceTime. Couldn't even be there to comfort him. But despite as overwhelming as that has been all week, I have watched the hand of God be at work. I have watched as his people have poured out the love of the Father on them in ways that I just and blown away by. And what God has shown me time and time again through all of this is he is not bound by social distancing. That he is our ever-present in times of need. And that he is working all things together for those that love him and are called according to his purposes. So what I would say to you is if you find yourself going through a difficult time, like the Mendez family, like the Johnsons family who I know are watching online right now, I just want to ask, would you be willing to take Jesus by the hand and let him carry you through this difficult time in your life? I don't know what's going on. But I simply just want to ask you, would you be willing to take Jesus by the hand and say, Jesus, I can't do this. Would you carry me through this time in my life? And if you're willing to do that, I can promise you this. I bet my life on it. That what you will begin to experience is not of this world. What you will begin to experience is the supernatural power and you will begin to experience that Jesus is our hope, unshakable hope, love, joy, peace, comfort. Even when everything in our life seems to be falling apart. All week long, the Lord has just been as I've just go, God, I just feel helpless at times of what can we do? How can I comfort our people when I can't be there? And all week long, as my heart has been breaking over news of death and job losses, the Lord just keeps bringing me back to the text. And these words I'm going to read to you over and over again in verse 16, Paul writes, he goes, therefore, in light of everything he's just told you, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And then he says something incredible. He says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, 
But what is unseen, it is eternal. And I just want to say to you, that's why we don't focus all our attention and our hope on things that we can see, touch, taste, and smell. Because everything has an expiration date outside of Jesus. And I love what Paul is doing here. You know why? Because he is painting a picture to the church. He's painting a picture to us of what is really going on in life. And he's reminding the church that even though we are outwardly wasting away, we are being renewed daily by the presence and provision of God Almighty when we spend time in his presence and in his word. He's telling the church that if what they are experiencing right now, which is pain, suffering, discomfort, betrayal, even loss of life, is the very thing that's achieving them an eternal reward that is far greater than any reward they could ever receive here on this earth. In the same way, Paul is reminding you watching today, he's reminding me that our momentary sufferings, our momentary inconveniences, our momentary sadnesses, they are achieving us a reward, an eternal reward. Sadly, if there's anything that I've learned and been reminded of over the last four weeks, losing both our grandparents and seeing a friend's dad pass away, is this sobering reality that death is still hovering around the 100 percentile. All of us are going to experience it. We are wasting away. But what has given me comfort and what I'm praying will give you comfort is you might not get a say of when you pass away. But you and I, we absolutely get a say in how you're going to live your life. And I am so grateful that TJ, that my grandmother, Mama Sue, that my grandmother, I called B, who was Betty Copeland and Betty Freeman, that she, that all three of them, they lived their lives for the glory of God. That when they took their last breath here on earth, that their life did, and their story did not stop. It just be continued on worshiping Jesus. And though it's almost impossible for us to understand that in a human context, it doesn't mean it's not true. And it should offer us tons of comfort. But what I want us to see is, even though we don't know when our time's going to be, we absolutely know and get a say in how we're going to live our lives, how you live your life, no matter how you feel about yourself, no matter if you feel you're qualified. I had that conversation with someone this week. She says, Brent, I just don't know if I could do this, this E3. How am I going to do this with people? I'm just all learning this. I said, well, look at who God used. As you read through the book of John, we're reading through the book of John right now in our reading plan. I said, just circle every person that God called. And then look, he used fishermen, tax collector, prostitutes. He used the, the B team. If you were putting a team together to change the world, that is the last team you would have put together. But it is absolutely the team that God put together to change the whole world. Because what God inside of them, the spirit of the living God, compelled them to live in such a way that it has never been the same. And what I would say, and what she said is, is, as soon as we got off the Zoom call, like right after her neighbor called and was like, hey, what are you doing? She's like, well, I've been doing this, I'm journaling and I'm reading through my Bible. She's like, really? She's like, I want to do that with you. And she's like, I'm already getting to do this with someone and you just told me I can do this. And I'm like, absolutely. And I'm like, if God can use me, he absolutely can use you. So we get to say and the reason our lives matters is because our lives matter, the way we live our lives matters to God, but it also matters to everyone around us. Why? Because they're depending upon us to point them to Jesus. People are in panic and, and freak out mode all throughout our country. And what they need to see us do is not be a people given in to fear and worry, but people that are grounded, that are self-controlled, and that are pointing people to the one who's allowing us to be that way. 
Not boasting in ourselves, but boasting in the one who brings peace. The peace that passes all understanding. I don't know if you know this or not, but your life is a walking billboard. You are a living and breathing commercial. And your life is broadcasting a signal to the world. And that signal is either telling people that you're living for Jesus or that you are self-consumed and you're living for yourself. And what God wants more for than anything from you and from me is this, is that we would broadcast a crystal clear live stream all the time. And what that stream would tell people is that we love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love our neighbors as ourselves. We love people the way Jesus loved them. I don't know about you, but I wanna leverage my life for a kingdom that's bigger than my own and it's not gonna end. And I wanna tell as many people as I can while I'm on this earth of how they can find an epic life in Jesus. And if that's something that you would wanna be a part of and that's something that you wanna do then I want to assure you that you need to fix your eyes on Jesus. You need to fix your eyes not on what is seen, not on the stock market, not on, you know, anything like that. You need to fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And when you begin to dig into this word day by day and asking God to speak and to meet with you, Though outwardly you are wasting away, God's word promises that he is making you new day by day so that you will be able to proclaim that he is our unshakable hope. And I hope and pray that's what you want to be a part of. As I've thought about what it's like to be a year old, I I thought about Man, we would not be here today, first and foremost, without the love of the Father. Jesus has done an incredible work in in our midst week after week. But what he has done is he's used people like you who've shown up every week to give. This week, we were able to help a single mom out who's not able to work. How do we do that? Because of your faithfulness to give. Every week, people show up and serve. How, do we, how are we doing this? There's a handful of people that we are allowed to have. They show up. Why? So that we can bring you a message every single week. And, we're, and, and what we've seen God do is not just because people have just shown up and people because people gave. It's because, man, you guys have invited your friends, your family, your neighbors, your coworkers to experience an epic life in Jesus. And what I just want to leave us with is this thought, is though things may be chaotic right now, and we don't know how things are going to play out, but I have said, as long as I have breath in my lungs, I want to fix my eyes on Jesus and let my life proclaim that he is my unshakable hope. And I have a strong feeling that that is what so many of you want. And so I just want to leave you with a charge today found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, part A. Paul writes, whatever happens, coronavirus, job layoff, divorce, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this crisis is going to pass. Something else is going to show up. But Paul is saying, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. And that's what I'm praying for you, and that's what I'm praying for me, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus in a time of need, that we would point people to our unshakable hope, Jesus, the Christ, 
the Son of the living God, who was, who is, and is to come. Would you pray with me? God, we love you. And Lord, we come to you and trust in you. That God, um, maybe for someone listening today, <clears throat> that just seems like a far cry. It's something they're still wrestling with. Because this week has just turned the whole world upside down. Or just there's just so many, maybe they haven't lost their job, but there's just the fear of losing their job. God, would you allow us to not give in to a spirit of fear? Would you allow us to be reminded that, God, you're in control, that you're working all things together for the good of those that love you and are called according to your purposes. If you're watching this live broadcast today and you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, I just want you to look at me at the screen. You don't have to bow your head. No one's looking around. It's probably just you and the people in the living room. But I just want you to know this. That you're not an accident. Scripture actually says you're the pre-thought creation of God Almighty. And if you hear anything I say this morning, I, I pray you would hear this. That God, what he desperately wants more than anything right now is for you to place your faith and trust in Jesus. No matter if you're old, if you're young, whether you used to walk with the Lord and, now you, and then you walked away for years and you've come back, I just want you to know, man, his offer is always the same. Come to me, all ye who are weary. And the way you can do that is just simply admit that you're a sinner. If you have kids, you don't have to, you don't have, to have anyone convince you that we're born with a sinful nature. We come out of the womb ready to hit, lie, steal, and cheat. But thank God, Jesus came and he lived the perfect life. He lived the perfect life, died on the cross, and then three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death. And so what you would have to say to Jesus today is say, Jesus, I want to place my faith and trust what you did on the cross and the empty tomb. Would you come into my life, save me, be the Lord of my life, be the boss of my life, take control of my life. Jesus, come in. If you've done that today, that's something you want to do, man, just, you can send us a message. You can send uh, uh, in the comment section, say, hey, today, I want Jesus. I trusted Jesus so we can know how to follow up with you. But I pray that you would share that with someone. If you have a need in your life, I pray that you would let us know Regardless of what is going on in your life, I just pray you would be open to the fact that Jesus is in control and that in this time of uncertainty, that we would be certain of what is certain and that we would fix our eyes on the one who is unshakable and never ending. And that's Jesus. So Lord, I just pray, would you just give everyone that's watching this morning the peace and assurance of knowing that you are well out in front of all of this, and that you're working things together for your good. We pray all this in your name. Amen. So this morning, we want to do a little something. I want to do something a little different in our time of response because obviously you're not in this room, and we, but we have a, the band. Is, there has been a new song that just come out recently, and it's called Graves into Gardens or Graves to Gardens. And uh, when I, the first time I heard this song, I was just hooked. But it's just a beautiful picture and a timely. I, I just think of some of my, the, the, the new worship songs that have just come out in the last month. I, it's not an accident that God put these words on these artists' hearts to write these worship songs. And I love what he says, you turn graves into gardens. I, I, I laugh, I, I, my my. my, my grandfather, I learned a lot about him. He died when I was in fifth grade. He had, um, 
he lo- he was a grass snob, and he had uh, his I think it was Bermuda grass he had, um, or whatever it was. It doesn't really matter. But his yard was impeccable. But he took plugs from his yard and went to his gravesite and plugged in grass all around his burial so that when he was buried one day, he would have this incredible sod all over the place. And when we went to go see my grandmother be buried 20, 30 30 years later, there was a 40-yard circle around his grave that was the sod from his yard. And I just thought, this is beautiful. And it makes me think of the song that God could turn graveyards into gardens and remind us even through the grass that he's doing something beautiful that he would turn uh, seas into highways and so today as these guys sing this song I pray it would minister to your heart as the way as it has mine and thousands of others who've listened to it and then maybe if you're still wrestling with God that God would just speak in your life that what feels like something terrible that's going on right now, and it might be terrible, but God has the ability to do something beautiful. And we love you, and I hope this encourages you. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together.
return 